Welcome to The Bee's Knees, a podcast full of articles, interviews, clinical studies, and advice about knee surgery, physical therapy, and life after knee surgery. Hi, this is PJ Ewing. I'm the host of the Bee's Knees podcast, and I'm here again to do part two of my series on threats to a proper knee replacement recovery. In the last episode, you may have heard uh, the discussion on deep vein thrombosis, the DVT, and today we're going to talk about infection and knee replacement and um, what devastating, in some cases, impact an infection can have on a proper recovery. And uh, we're going to go from the the definitions of in different types of infections through diagnosis through treatment we're going to cover all of that hopefully relatively quickly to take full advantage of your precious time uh, so let's get started uh, the first thing I want to discuss are, is the fact that there are really two types of infections to think about when it comes to knee replacement the first is superficial and the other one would be a deep infection so let's start with superficial after knee replacement surgery, it's possible to develop an infection right at the incision point, right in the incision. Doctors call these superficial, minor, or maybe they refer to them as early onset infections. Superficial infections usually occur soon after the surgery, so it doesn't take long for you to identify that there's a problem in the incision. Uh, you may develop a minor infection in the hospital or even after you've gotten to your home. The treatment is pretty simple, but a minor infection can lead to a major one if it's not treated. So the other type of infection that we're going to spend probably a lot more time on is the deep knee infection. Uh, you can also develop an infection around your artificial knee, the joint itself, the hardware, uh, which is also called a prosthesis or implant. Uh, doctors call these deep, major, delayed onset or even late onset infections. So deep infections are serious and they can occur weeks or even years after your knee replacement surgery. Years, believe it or not. Uh, the treatment may involve several steps. You may need to you may need surgery to remove the infected artificial knee itself. So this could lead to pulling out the hardware and uh, putting in new hardware, believe it or not. A knee replacement infection may develop in the wound after surgery. It may also occur around the artificial implant itself uh, that is you know, used to replace the knee joint. Harmful bacteria entering the wound usually are the cause for this kind of infection. Um, this kind of infection, a knee replacement infection, can occur any time after surgery at the hospital, once you get home, again months or years after the surgery. In a recent study by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, they did say that only 1% of every 100 people, so one out of 100 who have a hip or knee replacement, will develop an infection. So the, r the rate is really low. You, know, you can stop right now if you're someone who's going to worry and stop listening to anything else that I say because if this is going to cause stress, just don't, you know, it's 1%. But for those that you know want to hear the full story, keep going, keep listening, and we'll we'll keep talking about um, what what all the other aspects are. So, how to diagnose an infection? Uh, it may be evident to a surgeon that there is an infection in the knee with a simple visual inspection. When you when you go to your three week appointment, your six week appointment, boom, yes, I think you're infected. Uh, we need to take a couple tests, but I, I think I can see it. Um, there are a number of tests that they can go through and let's go through them right now. First is a simple blood test. This can help measure inflammation in the body which then can indicate an infection. So boom, there it is. I see an infection. Let's deal with it. But secondly, there's an imaging test or there are various imaging tests. This can help determine if there is an infection in the artificial joint itself. Ex examples of imaging tests include the x-ray of course, a computed tomography, a CT or CAT scan as we like to say, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, or even a bone scan. Now there's also joint aspiration as another way to determine if there's an infection going on. Uh, this is when fluid is drawn from the knee and tested for bacteria and white blood cells. A large number of white blood cells is a sign that the body is actively fighting an infection. 
There's also a tissue culture. The doctor may take a tissue sample from within the infected bone or joint. The doctor then sends this specimen to the laboratory for examination. And then there's actually a bone biopsy. So in this case, uh, if he suspects that you have an infection that isn't showing up uh, clearly on the imaging tests, uh, the surgeon would basically take a uh, part of the bone and send that in to have that tested. It really, they use a needle to remove a sample of the infected area and then get that tested. I do have a great link to an article on the uh, episode page. So again, if you go visit the, the blog itself, you'll see a link. And then there's also a terrific interview that we're going to hear next with Richie, who had an infection and had to deal with the implications of that infection. Um, there's a video on the website, but you can listen to it here. I think this would be uh, instructive in terms of what he did to recover from the infection and then how he got his range of motion back. Um, and in this case, of course, you know, lucky us, he used the X10 to recover. I'm from Boston. My name's Richie. I worked hard all my life. I'm 67 years old and I ended up uh, going for knee surgery about a year and a half ago. After four or five months, it wasn't getting any better. And uh, they just couldn't find out what was wrong with me. And then the therapist uh, said, I can't treat you anymore. You're not getting any better. I went back home, they did a battery of tests and scans and everything else, and they came up with, uh, I've got a, a bad infection in the knee, and I would have had to lose the leg. In my search on the internet, I found uh, this website that uh, had a, the X10. I got on that X10, and the machine just took over and gently over a period of 30 minutes would slowly increase your range of motion. It would go up uh, one degree at a time and it would, um, you know, very little pain. Well, after a while, um, I was pushing the limits of the machine and not feeling the pain. I looked forward to doing the machine and, and, and using it because it gave me comfort. It uh, gave me hope. Someone was facing a normal knee replacement, they'd be back on their feet in no time with the X10 because of the way it increases the range of motion. But right now, um, I'm pretty happy with the way, you know, the progress I've made. And uh, uh, the less swelling, the more range of motion and uh, the better you can get around. Okay, that was a great interview with Richie uh, from Boston, a wonderful guy. In fact, I did that interview with him a couple of years ago, and I'm, I'm glad that we can use it again here. Now, what is the cause of a knee infection? Let's talk about that. Bacteria might enter a person's body through the wound where the surgical incision was made after the knee replacement. If bacteria reaches a person's new artificial knee joint, they may multiply these bacteria and cause the infection. Some bacteria are harmless, of course. Think of what's in your stomach. That's really good and useful bacteria. Other bacteria may harm a person and cause the infection. Your immune system most likely will kill any harmful bacteria that get in the bloodstream. With a knee replacement, the knee joint is replaced with an artificial joint made of metal and plastic. Because these materials are not organic, it's harder for the body to kill the bacteria on them. So there you go. If something comes into your body and there is bad bacteria on it that was undetected, the body is going to have trouble dealing with it because it's not organic. And there you go. Now you've got an infection. And it wasn't anything that you did wrong. It was just that the, you know, it was contaminated before it got into your body. And, and there it is. So. What are the risks that you should be considering when you're, when you're talking about this uh, infection? Anyone who has a knee replacement can develop an infection after surgery, okay? So it's, it, it, it doesn't pick and choose. It could be anybody. But some groups are at greater risk of infection. And let's go through that list. Those that have a poor circulation in their hands or feet. Those that are using treatments to suppress the immune system. For instance, chemotherapy would be a good example. If you have a frequent urinary tract infection, 
uh, if you're heavier, have a high BMI over 50. Maybe you have an immune deficiency, HIV, or maybe there's lymphoma going on in the system. Uh, if you have diabetes, dental problems, dermatitis, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis. A big one is if you're a smoker, your, your immune system is compromised slightly. If you've had a knee injury or knee surgery before, maybe there's uh, residual bacteria from the past surgeries. Um, and if you've had, an, of course, had an infection in the knee before, you know, that's uh, obviously a red flag. So how do you treat these, um, these infections? Um, there are both non-surgical and surgical solutions to um, uh, treating an infection. Let's talk about both. First, the non-surgical. Some knee replacement infections are superficial, right, which we talked about right on the edge, on the outside, at the, um, at the wound itself. A superficial knee replacement infection usually is treated with oral or intravenous IV antibiotics. So it's relatively straightforward. You take antibiotics. It was right on the incision point, and, you know, it's dealt with. However, if it goes deeper into the skin, into the tissue around the joint, which we talked about, the deep infection, they may need to treat it surgically. And so there are a couple ways to go about it if you really have a, um, an infection deep inside the, the body. So there is a treatment called a debridement. This is a surgical washout of the joint. Any contaminated tissue, soft tissue, is removed and the artificial joint is cleaned. Okay, so you're going in, cleaning the area, cleaning the joint, removing soft tissue, plastic liners or spacers in the artificial joint may be replaced, and then you go on the IV antibiotic cocktail to deal with, um, deal with the infection. And then there's also a staged surgical solution, a staged surgery. Now, this involves a series of surgeries to remove and replace the artificial joint. This may be necessary if the infection has developed months or years after the original knee replacement. So how does this work? First, there's the removal of the artificial joint. Uh, it's taken out. Uh, the washing helps get rid of the infection in the soft tissue. There's an antibiotic spacer. So you have a new piece of hardware placed into the joint area and this helps maintain joint space and keeps the joint aligned while the infection is treated. Uh, IV antibiotics, they help kill the infection. And then, you know, after about six weeks, a new knee replacement surgery happens and then we're, you know, sort of starting over with a new joint, new hardware, uh, and this is really only after the infection has been treated. Uh, the spacer comes out, the new joint goes in. Um, but what happens? What are the results? What are the odds of uh, success after these different types of um, you know, surgical solutions? Remember, there's the washout, the debridement, and then there's the staged surgery. Um, well, I looked at a study that was done in 2015, and uh, I found that really the best success is that when you don't have to remove the entire joint, the, the solution which is really just washing, um, cleaning, and then uh, treating. The, the results were a lot better in terms of patient satisfaction and happiness when you didn't have to take the full joint out, wait six weeks or longer, and then put a new joint in. Those results were um, with less satisfaction on the part of the patients. Uh, again, the study is, is referenced and linked to in the, on the show notes on the episode page. Um, I also included something very useful. It's about a nine-minute video. Uh, there are two surgeons who go into great detail on this topic as well as a bunch of others. Uh, they have a website called talkingwithdocs.com. Uh, Dr. Paul Zalzow and Brad Weening. Dr. Brad Weening. Um, and if you just want to go watch their video, that's a great way to learn all this stuff as well, much of this stuff. Um, and uh, I would suggest that you go ahead and take a look at that nine-minute nine video if this is a topic of interest to you. And it must be. You're still here listening to me, right? Um, so how do you prevent a knee infection? This is maybe useful for everybody. Um, you really do want to prevent if you can. So let's, let's talk, about, uh, to talk about that. Using prophylactic antibiotics. So this is preventative medicines that can help reduce the risk of knee in replacement infection. So this is a conversation with your surgeon. Hey, I've had infection issues before. I've had a urinary tract infection. Is there something I should be doing right now to make sure I don't have a worse infection when I have the knee replacement? That's a, a chat you have with your surgeon. 
using antibiotics, doing that immediately before, during, and after the surgery for up to 24 hours. That's another good preventative measure. Um, keeping the operation time short. Not that you have control over this, um, but sometimes this could influence you in terms of doing one or two knees. If you're doing both knees at once, the surgery can be longer. You're in under the knife for a longer period of time. It might be a, a, you know, a thought that you go with one knee versus two uh, because a longer operating time means that the wound is open for longer and vulnerable to infection. Uh, reducing the number of people present, a small operating team versus a larger one, you know, less chance for bacteria to get in there and um, get in the way. Sterile equipment, obviously very important. Um, screening for bacteria in the nose. If a person has certain types of harmful bacteria in their nasal passage, this may increase the risk of infection. Some hospitals screen for these bacteria before operating. Good question to be asking your surgeon. If harmful bacteria are found, the person will be given an antibacterial ointment to use. Some medical centers will routinely decolonize nasal passages uh, a few days before surgery. And lastly, washing with clohexidine. This may help reduce the number of harmful bacteria on the skin before surgery. After knee replacement, there's still work you can do to minimize the risk of infection. Following the doctor's advice on how to treat the wound, for instance. That's in your control some of the time. Cleaning and covering cuts, wounds, or burns as soon as they happen, and maintaining really good dental hygiene. Uh, it's uh, maybe known to you, maybe not, but infections in the mouth may spread to the artificial joint. You know, brush your teeth, floss, take good care of your, your dental hygiene, and, and it could be beneficial to you as well. Lastly, don't panic. Remember what I said at the beginning of the article. Only 1% of hip and knee patients are diagnosed with an infection. 1%. That's tiny. So don't stay up at night worrying about an infection. Uh, the odds are certainly with you. That said, just be smart. Take some steps. Protect yourself. Talk to the surgeon. Choose a good hospital that has a very low infection rate or non-existent infection rate. Those are published statistics. And pass on this podcast to anyone you know who has a knee surgery upcoming. The more we take care of each other, the better off we'll all be. Thanks again for listening to the Bees Knees podcast. Rating and reviewing us is always incredibly helpful. And if you want to reach out to us and uh, become a guest on the show or you have some subject that matter that you'd like us to cover, uh, it's the Bees Knees podcast at gmail.com. And with that, I'll say thanks. Thanks for listening. See you next time. To learn more, visit x10therapy.com, 1-855-910-5633. Just a reminder, it's a huge help if you subscribe to, rate, and review our podcast. It helps people find us. X10, back to full strength.